Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is the CEO of 2.0 LCA Consultants and obtained his PhD with a study on life cycle assessment of rapeseed oil and palm oil. He is an assistant professorship at Elbok University and main areas of expertise are life cycle assessments. Here to present his talk on five edible oils, a comparison. Please welcome Dr. Janik Schmidt. Thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you very much for inviting me for giving this presentation. During the next 15 minutes, I'll give a presentation of a recently finalized study, not yet published. It's commissioned by the RSPO and it's about the sustainability of five different vegetable oils. When we are talking about sustainability, the approach in this study here is life cycle assessment. I don't know if all of you are very familiar with this tool. It's, it's an environmental assessment method where you uh, take into account all the emissions and impacts from the very cradle to the grave of a product. So it takes into account the emissions from fertilizer production, from the plantation, the oil mills, and the refinery. So it's the whole life cycle of the product. The purpose of this study here is twofold. The first purpose is to obtain some environmental information on different vegetable oils. So as you see in the top of the slide, is to give a kind of ranking of different oils for different indicators. Secondly, uh, the second approach is to assess the market responses and the environmental consequences of taking out one particular oil and then compensate it with a mix of other oils. And I'll come back to that. That's, that's a small illustration in the bottom of, of the slide here where I have reduced uh, oil A with one ton and then I compensate with a mix of other oils with one ton. And then we see what are the market consequences and the environmental consequence of that. The included oils in the study represent some of the major oils in the market. So it's palm oil, soybean oil, rapeseed oil, and sunflower oil and peanut oil. Good. The, you could say the reference of, the pro, uh, of this study here when showing results, uh, that is done to what we call a functional unit in life cycle assessment. So for the first purpose, where we obtain environmental information of different oils, the functional unit is one ton of refined oil. So when I show results, it's relatively to one ton of oil. For the second purpose, where we reduce one oil and then compensate with other oils, the functional unit is reduction of one ton of this oil and then increase of a mix of other oils, oils by one ton. Good. The included environmental indicators in this project here it's limited to three key indicators. Of course, it does not give the full environmental impact, the picture of the full impact, but still it's three important key indicators. The first is greenhouse gas emissions measured in carbon dioxide equivalents. The second one is a proxy indicator for biodiversity. It's here very crudely modeled as just how much land do we occupy. And thirdly, we have investigated water consumption uh, where we have accounted for the so-called blue water and we have weighted by the water stress index, taking into account the water availability in different countries in the world. Well, regarding the market responses and comparability of the different oils, I'll come back to that in the next slides. And another special feature included in this study here is that we take into account the land use changes and I'll come back to that, why that is particularly important for the results. That's also in the next slide. Well, first, to the market responses and to the comparability of the different oils. Uh, first of all, first of all, we'll see that oil systems, they are all associated with byproducts. And those byproducts are typically animal feed, that's oil meals. So when we change the production of a particular oil, we also change uh, the production of feed products and there will be some market responses related to that. So when we want to compare different oils, we have to take into account that the different oils come with different amounts of those animal feeds. So that the market responses here are really important. And we have to ensure that the compared systems, they are really 
equivalent, and I'll show here on the next slide what I mean when I say equivalent comparisons. I've here very briefly uh, illustrated the palm oil system and the rapeseed oil system. You don't have to follow all the numbers, that's not so important. But what you see in the bottom line here is the, all the co-products that comes with the product systems. So we cannot just compare one kilogram of palm oil and one kilogram of rapeseed oil like this here because it comes with different amounts of co-products. So we have to take into account the market responses. So when we send additional feed products into the market, we will substitute some alternative feed production. And that is very likely to be some protein feeds and some energy feeds. Uh, and the protein feeds is very likely to be soybean meals from, uh, produced in Brazil, and the uh, energy feeds is likely to be a barley, because that's a major energy feed crop. And we take into account the same substituted system for the rapeseed, and we substitute different amounts. So having this here, we have a very good uh, uh, baseline for comparison of the different systems. To complicate things a little bit here, uh, there are two different cases when we do this kind of modeling. We can say the most common case, it works like I illustrate here, that we have a vegetable oil production, and when we change the demand for the particular oil, we'll send some more animal feed into the animal feed market, and we'll substitute some alternative feed. So the effect of demanding a, partic a particular oil will be the oil emissions, the oil system, minus the substituted feed. That is the dotted line. It illustrates the substituted systems. For the soybean system, it's a bit different because the main purpose of growing soy and having a soybean oil meal is the oil meal, the animal feed. So when I demand soybean oil, I will actually not affect the production of soybean. Instead, I will affect the users of soybean. So they have, some users have to give up some soybean, and they have to use another oil instead, and that is very likely to be palm oil. So the effect of demanding soybean oil will actually be the same as the effect of demanding palm oil. A few more words on the indirect land use change to, to tell you what it is all about. Uh, this number you see here, it was actually exactly the same number. It was mentioned in the first keynote presentation this morning that we can see from the newest research that 10% of global CO2 emissions originate from land use chains. So it's a huge source of emissions we are talking about. So excluding this from environmental studies, that is absolutely wrong. Secondly, what we do in this model here is that we say, why do we see land use changes? And our assumption here is that no one do deforestation just for fun. It is done because there's a demand for land. So it is the demand for land that drives deforestation and change, land use changes. Further, we see land as a global asset. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, we can see here in Indonesia, land use changes are occurring. If we look in Europe, we don't see very much land use changes. But actually, I claim we have almost the same land use change effects eventually. And I'll, I'll illustrate that. I've here put a small picture, nice picture, of a European landscape. Currently, we are growing, let's say, barley here. What happens if I change the demand of rapeseed? Well, I have to plant my rapeseed there. One nice hectare, nice landscape view, very yellow. But what, what is the effect of doing so? Yeah, before I was growing five tons of barley there. So definitely, the end users, they will not stop using this barley. They will have to source the barley from somewhere else. So that, that barley has to be produced somewhere else. So eventually, we may see the same kinds of land use changes from changing demand of rapeseed as when we are changing demand of palm oil. OK, it seems like this one here is stuck now. Here it comes. What we see land, the way we perceive land in the model is we see land as a capital input or an asset. Of course, when we grow something, we need tractors, and we need to produce those tractors. So they, those emissions are, of course, included in the study. We also need machinery, but we also need land. So we see land is actually the same as a tractor here. And then we just need to answer the question, how do we produce land? Land is can be produced generally in two different ways. 
Firstly, we can do land transformation, deforestation, or we can intensify, and both those things are included in the study here. Uh, and, and the driver here is the productivity of land. Uh, I will not go too much into detail, but we take into account that we have the potential productivity of land as the driver of land use change. So one hectare in Europe is equivalent to 0.6 hectares in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, because we have a higher potential production here in this region of the world. Good. Now I will move on to the results. Uh, the first results I will show here are the uh, life cycle results for greenhouse gas emissions. We see the different oils uh, uh, up here. The numbers may a be a little bit slow. Uh, but what we see, we can generally see from those figures here that we can create a general ranking of the different oils where we see rapeseed oil, which is the one in the middle, is the best performing regarding greenhouse uh, gases. Palm oil and soybean coming as the, on the second, and the worst uh, performing oils are the sunflower oil and peanut. You see the red part of the bars represent indirect land use changes, so you see that there's added a good portion of impact related to that, especially for sunflower and peanut because they are associated with relatively low yields. So they demand a lot of land, whereas palm and rapeseed do not demand so much land. If we go to how much land is needed in the life cycle for those uh, different oils, again, I have divided the, the bars here in a blue and a uh, red uh, uh, part. The blue one relates to the direct system, so that is the oil plantation for the oil system. And it may be hard to see, but if you look at the one in the middle, the rapeseed, uh, you see a blue one, that is the rapeseed system, and the red one is the displaced system. So it is displaced land in Brazil for the soybean meal being produced there, and the barley, the displaced barley production. Uh, and again, for the ranking, we can see that the best performing are palm oil and soybean oil, and then comes rapeseed. If you go to the water use, actually what we see here is quite interesting because we see that some of those uh, oils here are actually associated with negative water consumption. And the immediate reaction to such things would be, no, that cannot be. But it's, again, it's here because some of oils are almost not irrigated or not irrigated and then what they substitute is irrigated. So if you displace some irrigated soybeans in Brazil, then you have a negative contribution. And again, we can make the ranking. Good. And what's then behind all these numbers? I definitely do not have the time to go in detail, but this is just to illustrate the level of detail we can actually break down the results. Uh, and for that, when the report is released, uh, you can find all this detailed information. It's completely transparent what is going on in the study. Then going to the results where we reduce one oil and then compensate with other oils. Um, well, we, if we reduce one oil, and then we will compensate with the average mix of the other oils. And this average mix is based on the global production of the different oils in 2011. That's why I have shown the graph in the top. So if we take the first column in the table where we reduce palm oil by one ton, then we will see that it's compensated by 0.5, kilo, uh, 0.5 tons of soybean and so forth. But as I mentioned before, if we demand soy, we will actually affect palm oil because of the market responses. So we have to take all the numbers in the soybean row and move it up into the palm oil row. So it will change like this. So this table here is what's behind the next results I will show. So those are the mixes of oils being investigated. So here I move to the results where I reduce a particular oil that's the first group of uh, bars represent the uh, palm oil and the next p uh, soybean and so forth where they are reduced and then compensated with other oils. The black bars represent the total result. And what we see here is that uh, palm oil, rapeseed oil and uh, soybean oil, when they are being reduced and compensated by other oils, you actually increase the impact. So you should not reduce those oils if you want to have low greenhouse gases whereas uh, uh, reduced sunflower and peanut decreases uh, the impacts. So it's good to reduce those oil if, if possible and if you want to make greenhouse gas savings. Uh, 
I can show the same results regarding uh, land use changes here, and the next slide is uh, water. I will not go into detail with that because then I'm running out of time, but you can see more information on the results. It's on a poster in the, in the foyer out there. So I will go straight to my conclusions. And to say a few words on the results per ton of, of uh, vegetable oil. Generally, we can group it into a low-impact group of oils, which are palm oil, soybean oil, and rapeseed oil, and a high-impact group of oils, sunflower and peanut. Regarding the reducing and compensating scenarios, where we reduce one oil and compensate with a mix with oil, other oils, we can see, if we compare the different results, that there are trade-offs among different environmental impacts uh, for substituting any particular oil. So it's difficult to give a straight answer and a clear answer what to do. But generally we can say it's beneficial to replace the high impact oils with the low impact oils. So that should be the rule of thumb for that. Further, what is actually recommended here is instead of focusing too much in replacing different oils, it may be much more beneficial to focus on how the different oils are being produced. And especially for palm oil, we see that we have huge reduction potentials. We have improvement options, which no other oils have. We can reduce the cultivation of peat, we can capture methane from uh, palm oil mill effluent, and we can increase the yield. And not to mention also conservation. So there are huge improvement potentials which are not seen with the other oils. And that should be the really focus. And with that, I want to say thank you for your attention and looking forward to questions and discussions.